Uh, this morning, I'm getting a lot of flack on this title. It's not very creative. Because last week, my title was You Got This, and I ran long. So this week, it's You Got This Again. Um, <clears throat> um, said it was either You Still Got This or You Got This Again. That was my only two options. I'm not a real uh, creative title guy. But this morning, I want to talk again about discipleship and, and evangelism and how they go hand in hand and exactly what we are to do in that and what we're instructed to do and what Jesus told us to do. Last week, um, I went, I had too much. That's not, I'm usually the guy that gets you out of here five minutes early, and uh, I like that, and I'm sure you do too. <clears throat> but last week, this is my topic. This is the thing I could go on and on, and I'm, you know what? I didn't get everything said first service, so... Um, but I'm not preaching next week. Pastor Jim will be back, and he will be preaching, so I can't continue this on for ages and ages. So i got to get it all in here today. This morning, I want to start um, at Matthew 28 again. We talked, it was the first place we started last week with the Great Commission, uh, Matthew 28. So while you're turning there, I want to do a quick review about last week. We talked about how important this moment was when Jesus addressed the disciples and, and gave them the great commission. We talked about how Jesus told the disciples ahead of time, come meet me on this mountain. I have something I need to tell you. I need to tell you face to face that he set this moment up. And this was so very important because this was after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead back in a flesh body and said, this is so important. I have to tell you this before I ascend into heaven. We talked about having a willingness to be rejected. When you talk to people about Jesus, that you can't just ignore it because it's uncomfortable. You have to have a willingness to be rejected and how you can't change the system that Jesus put into place just because it makes you uncomfortable. I know some of you were listening because um, in the process, I said, if you're afraid that people aren't going to talk to you anymore when you tell them about Jesus, to tell the people that you don't like and people that annoy you first because maybe they'll leave you alone. And I had people afterwards come up to me uh, this week and say, why does everybody keep coming up to me and say, I want to tell you about Jesus? <clears throat> I said, don't take it personal. But at least I know you were listening. We talked about having the Holy Spirit inside of you to help you in that very hour to know what to say. We talked about making every effort and the difference between planting a seed, watering a seed, and reaping the harvest. Now, if you weren't here last week, um, you can go back, you can go online, and you can watch it on YouTube. If you go to our website, our website is www.cotod, C-O-T-O-D, for Church of the Open Door, dot church. It's not dot com, it's dot church. Don't go to dot com, because I've been there. Go with dot church. If you go on there, you can find links to our, our YouTube page, and uh, you can watch last week's sermon. You can actually go back like two years for the sermons there. Um, you can also find our audio podcast there, which goes back to 2011, I believe. So there's a lot of stuff on there. It's all out there. Please utilize those resources um, on there. We also put them on Facebook. We usually put the links out every week, so you can see those on there. Um, and if you're a person that wants something in your hand, you can always order a CD or a DVD at the Welcome Center. I just want you to know that uh, those things are available. Please use those resources um, as you need those. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. We're going to start there. I want to read that to you again. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I want to start with the scripture again this week because this is really the launching pad. This is where we see that Jesus is directly telling us, you need to tell people about Jesus. He's giving us a, a direct command. If you read here, it, this is not a, a suggestion. This is not a, hey, do me a favor and go do this. We're not doing a favor to God. He is telling us, this is what you need to do. This is a command that I'm giving to you. Last week, I had a number of people come up to me after service and tell me, oh, I really enjoyed the message. You did a great job. The two things I kept hearing is, we really needed to hear that, or that was a great reminder. Those are the two things I kept hearing over and over and over again. Now, I, first of all, I want to say thank you for the encouragement. I appreciate that. 
that's necessary for your pastors. Uh, when, when we do preach in that, it's very helpful to have that encouragement. That's great. But I want to tell you, it's more encouraging when you come back the next week and say, hey, I want to introduce you to this person. I told them about Jesus this week. They got saved. Now I'm bringing them to church. Seeing the fruit is where the encouragement really comes in. We do need to encourage each other. But here's my question today. Now, this is not a, don't answer this out loud. Don't raise your hand. This is a rhetorical question. Last week, everybody said, oh, we really needed to hear that about telling people about Jesus. You've had a week. Did you tell anybody about Jesus? Did you do it? Did you put it into practice? Because you told me out of your own mouths, I needed to hear that. So did you do it? I'm not going to let you slide by with hearing and not doing. The Bible says we need to be doers of the word, not hearers only, because God doesn't let me slide by. He works on me as well. He hits me with the same stuff, only it's a little bit harder when he goes, hey, remember that thing you said? <laughs> remember that thing you were teaching people? I'm going to keep you accountable because God keeps me accountable. God's been working on me this week. Don't you just hate it when God just keeps poking at something to get his point across? And you can't ever, everything you see and everything you do, that's what it always comes back to. It's like somebody flicking you in the nose. And it's like, just stop it. Just leave me alone. Now, this is something, when I, when I spend time in prayer, one of the things that I, I find myself saying all the time is I say, God, make it obvious. Make it obvious. Okay, God, you know, I, I need to do this, but make it obvious because I miss things sometimes. Sometimes I'm just not that observant. I think for the most part I'm pretty good. I do pretty well at observing my surroundings and see what's going on, but I miss things. Anybody else miss things? I misplace things as well. I lose things. Um, you can ask the staff. I lose my coffee cup all the time. I'm constantly going, where's my coffee cup? I lost it the other day for two hours. You know where I found it? On my desk <laughs> that I was sitting at. But it was on the wrong side of my desk. So somebody must have moved it because I certainly wouldn't put it on the other side of the desk. I miss things. So I do that. I, I ask God, make it obvious to me so I can't deny that I saw it. This week I was out of town. I was driving back from an appointment, and I'm driving on the highway, and all of a sudden we went down to 45 miles an hour, and I'm going, what the heck is going on? And I couldn't figure out what was the deal. It was a two-lane highway. There was four or five cars in front of me. I couldn't go around them. So when we approach the next town, we get into a four-lane road, and everybody goes around, and I see that there is a delivery truck in the front that's going slow. Now, it's a vending service truck. And the reason I know it's a vending service truck is because the back door was open. And I could see all the bottles of pop, and I could see the chips and the candy and everything, and they're wiggling around pretty good in there. And some of the flats are starting to work their way towards the back door. And I'll be honest, my first thought was, boy, it stinks to be that guy. And then I thought, I'm going to get around him because I don't want something falling out and hitting me. That was my thought. And then I got that flick that says, why don't you tell him that his back door's open? And I found myself saying the same excuses that I talked about last week that people use, why not, to share the gospel. And I said, well, maybe he probably already knows it's open. Maybe he's in a hurry and he doesn't want to have to open the door at the next stop. And then I thought, well, he was on the highway. He's probably not meaning to leave it open. I thought, well, nobody else told him. There was four or five cars in front of me. Nobody else did it. Somebody else could have done it. All right? And I thought, well, I don't know how to tell him. I'm driving down the road. How am I supposed to tell him? I don't know how. And as I said that, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, crud. I just said those exact same words up front about how those are not excuses. So I said, okay, I'm going to tell him. So I pulled up next to him. And I went like this. You got that, right? Your back door is open. That's what I did. And he didn't understand. And he thought I was nuts. And I can tell you that he thought I was nuts because I pulled up to the stoplight and he was back here. And as I slowed down again, he was doing this, like looking out the corner of his eye, like, 
Something's wrong with that guy. He didn't get it. That's not my fault. I told him. And then that scripture came back to mind that we talked about last week. Make every effort. Make every effort. And I sat there and I thought, well, I already told him. I thought, well, did I make every effort? No, I didn't. Well, what if I look stupid? And I said, I don't even live in this town. I don't care. So I rolled down my window. I pulled up next to him. I just started yelling. I just kept yelling, and he was still eyeballing me, and I thought, I'm not quitting until he rolls down that window. And I'm just yelling and screaming, and he rolls down the window, and I said, hey, your back door's open. And his eyes lit up. He goes, oh, thank you. And he immediately pulled off and shut the door. Now, I didn't just drive around him. I didn't say a prayer to say, oh, Jesus, please send somebody to tell him his door is open because he needs to know this. I didn't do that. I didn't grab my phone and go online and say, is there anybody who specializes in telling people that their door's open? I'd like to make a $10 donation to the cause. I didn't do that. I was right there. I could step in and tell him. Just like this, when we see someone in need of Christ, we need to step in. Now, don't take it to the extreme. Don't start being aggressive and confronting people, and, and don't put yourself in a morally compromising state Men and women, you know, be smart about it. Don't go extreme. I know some people that have gone extreme. I had a guy tell me one time, hey, I I talked to somebody at work about Jesus and he got saved. So I guess I must be called to be a pastor or an evangelist. And I went, well, you might be, but that's not how you know. We're supposed to all be leading people to Christ. When I got a positive response from the truck driver, I didn't say, well, I must be called to drive around town, tell everybody when the doors are open. (laughs) I'm going to start a Kickstarter. I'm going to get on there. And you know what else I could do when it's raining? I could tell people their windows are down. (laughs) No, I didn't. That was not my calling just because I did it once. But I'll tell you what, it's made me more apt to notice around town if there's a truck with the door open. Because I saw it. I addressed it. I had a positive response. When we do that, when we share Christ with people and tell people about Jesus, that more and more you will start recognizing those opportunities and those situations where you can step in and tell people about Jesus, and you'll be more and more comfortable with it. Pastor your job site. Just because you lead somebody to work at work to the Lord does not mean you're called to go do something else. That means you're being successful where you're at. Continue to pastor that work site. Are you the only Christian where you work? And do you complain about it? Do you say, well, I wish there'd be some more Christians around here? If you were a salesperson that worked on commission and you were the only salesperson in the company, you wouldn't say, boy, I wish you'd bring some more people in here. You'd say, I got all this. This is all mine. That's the way we need to be when we're in those situations to look around and say, hey, I can reach every one of these people for Christ. That's what I can do. We need to use our surroundings. Jesus didn't sit around and say, okay, it's time to make disciples. Everybody grab a textbook, get a handout. We're going to sit around the table, and this is how we're going to do it. He walked around, and he said things like, hey, the kingdom of heaven is like a field when they're walking around. He walked up to a fig tree and said, you can see by these leaves that summer is coming. So you can see by what's happening in the world that the end is near. He used parables and stories whatever was around him to talk to people. When he was talking to the woman at the well, they were talking about water. He said, will you give me a drink? She said, well, you don't even have anything to, you know, get it out of the well. He says, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for living water. He used the opportunity that was right in front of him. It's all throughout the Bible. People use things that were happening around them. They took advantage of the situation. Paul, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, we're going to start in verse 16, read a couple, and then we're going to skip down here. Um, I'm going to read a big chunk here. So, Acts 17, 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, at this point, he's waiting for Silas and Timothy to meet him in Athens. It says, his spirit was so provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Skip down to verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. 
For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling places that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For even as some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think of the divine uh, being as like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art or imagination of men. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he, is appoint, he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed. So Paul's sitting in Athens and he's waiting for, Paul, uh, for Silas and Timothy, and he notices there's a lot of idols around here. And he took note of his surrounding, and he looked, and he saw one of them said to the unknown God. And he took advantage of that. So he started going to the, to the synagogues every day and saying, I have something to tell you, I have something to tell you. Finally, they said, okay, go, go say it in front of all these people. So he stands there, and he says, hey, I can see you're very religious, but you have questions about this one. Let me tell you, I know who that is, and I want to tell you about it. He said, I'm looking around, and I noticed that you have one you don't know, and I know him. He didn't say, hey, losers, you got it all wrong here. He didn't say, how can you be so dumb? He didn't do that. He said, I can see that you're interested in knowing the truth, I know the truth, and I want to share it with you. Look at verse 32 there again. Some mocked. Some wanted more information before they made a decision. Some believed. First of all, I want you to see that even Paul, they didn't all believe. He preached to all of them. They didn't all believe. There's going to be those who don't believe when you tell them. He wasn't able to reach any, everyone, but he still tried but look at these three types of people again. Some mocked, some wanted more information, some believed. Does that look familiar? The scripture we talked about last week, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6 says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. Some mocked, Paul planted the seed. Some wanted more information, he watered the seed. Some believed, he reaped the harvest. He hit all three of them right there. Use your surroundings. When you use your surroundings, you also you have to know who you're talking to. Later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings." I have become all things to all people so that I might save some. You won't win them all. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. He didn't say I've become all things to some people because that's all I'm going to get. I've become all things to all people that I might save some. I, I try to do this. I, I think I'm pretty good at talking to people. I'm not very shy. I'm pretty good at talking to darn near anyone. I would say I, I can have a serious conversation with a two-year-old or a hundred-year-old. It doesn't matter. Anybody in between. 
But the key is this, you don't talk to them the same way. You don't walk up to a two-year-old and say, hey, you read any good books lately? That's not going to work. What's the first thing you do? You walk up to a two-year-old, it's the first thing you do. You get down here. Why? Because now I'm on your level. And usually you say something they can grasp, like, hey, you got a race car on your shirt there, buddy? Something like that. Because it's something they can go, oh, yeah, I do. It's something tangible that they can get a hold of and say, yes, I understand what you're saying. Becoming all things to all people. I've worked at a lot of different places. I worked at a trucking company. I've delivered furniture. I've delivered uh, automotive paint. I, worked, I ran a sandblaster for a granite company. I worked at a lot of places uh, in ministry, before ministry, where I worked with many, many different people. And when I worked at those places, when I talked to people about Jesus, I talked like they did. Not necessarily some of those truck drivers. Some of the truck drivers can, I can't talk like that. But I talked on their level. I didn't walk up to somebody and say, so, when I wanted to tell them about Jesus, say, so what's your epistemological construct uh, via the rapture? Because they're not going to know what the heck I'm talking about. But we do that. The same reason you don't go into the nursing home and say, okay, who's ready to die today? That's not what you say at the nursing home. You have to know your surroundings. I love it when I'm, when I'm out around town and talking to people just at the grocery store or the restaurant or whatever. I don't tell them right away that I'm a pastor. I get to talking to people and whatnot, just about anything and everything. And when they find out that I'm a pastor, I get the same response all the time. They go, you're a pastor? You don't look like a pastor. And my response is always, why? Because I'm not old and fat? Is that what you're trying to say? <clears throat> not in any way saying that pastors are old and fat. I'm saying <laughs> that's a perception in the mind of some of these people because they usually say, yeah. But the perception is that they go, well, they, they think, oh, if you told me you were a pastor, I wouldn't have talked to you because pastors, they're going to try to get me to go to church and put money into place. That's the perception they have in their mind. Too many times we go in too strong as Christians, and we go beating people over the head with the Bible, and the red lights start going off, and they go, ah, Christian, get away, get away, and they take off before you can even tell them about Jesus. you got to be yourself. Don't go by a script. There is nothing in the Bible that says, here is how, uh, say these words and they'll get saved. Have people repeat this. Do this. It, it doesn't say word for word, do like this. You have to be yourself. God created you as who you are because you can reach people that other people can't. People have a perception because Christians tend to be someone else when people know we're a Christian. I try to be the same. I used to be like that all the time. When I first got into ministry, I thought I had to be somebody else on Sunday than I was on Monday. I thought I had to impress people. I had to do whatever. Uh, I try really hard not to do that now. I try to be the same person standing right here as I'll be tomorrow. You've got to build a relationship. Build some trust. Even if you're at a restaurant and it's one minute's worth of trust that you can build with that waitress before you talk to them, that's so very important. Build that trust. Okay, so what do I say? How do I tell people about Jesus? I thought to myself, you know what? I'm curious to see what people are saying about this. So I Googled it. How do I tell people about Jesus? I don't recommend you Googling that because there are some very bad ideas on there, very bad ideas. Here's a couple of ideas I saw. I don't recommend these. I think they're ineffective and stupid. The first one that came up, said, when you go to the coffee shop, tell the barista that your name is Jesus died for your sins and he loves you very much. That way they have to yell it out when your coffee's done. I don't see that being helpful. That sounds confusing. Another one actually said, Christian graffiti. It showed you how to spray paint Jesus saves on your neighbor's stuff. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. Those are a couple I found there. I've got a couple pet peeves, and I'm probably going to hear about this one because I'm probably going to get in trouble for this later on. <clears throat> one of my biggest pet peeves 
You all know how much I love candy. I'm a big candy fan. Halloween. Okay, I'm not going into whether to Halloween or not Halloween or whatever. I will tell you this. In Halloween, I hand out candy. I hand out candy because it's the only day of the year that kids knock on my door from my neighborhood and ask me for something. If they know that I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor, I'm going to give them what they're asking me for. Now, so when I give out candy, I give out good candy. Okay? I'm probably, now that I've said this both services, next year I'm going to have to buy a ton of candy. I give out good candy. This last year I gave out nerd ropes. I give out... uh, the smallest thing I've ever given out was a full-size candy bar. I gave out licorice ropes one year, the three-foot. I had a kid come to my door, and I handed him that licorice rope, and his eyes lit up, and he ran back uh, to the sidewalk where his mom was standing, and I heard him yell, Mom, 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 these people really know how to party. I'm going, you got it. You got it. But the pet peeve that I have at Halloween, okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to say right up front, I do not have a problem with Bible tracts. But people that give out only Bible tracts for Halloween, if all you give them is a tract, they're not going to read that. I remember as a kid uh, going to a parade, and I was jumped out in in the road because there was these big, long red things. It was a shiny cellophane wrapper around them. I'm like, oh, I don't know what kind of candy that is, but it's huge. And I got home, and it was a Bible tract. There was no candy in it at all. You know what I did with it? Gone. If you give out tracks at Halloween, that's fine. My mom does. She, she asked me about it one time, and I said, okay, I'm going to give you a lesson. Don't just give them a Bible track, and don't staple a tiny little Tootsie Roll to it either. <laughs> don't do that. I said, put that thing around a big old candy bar or something really good. Don't go cheap. Go good. Because if somebody gets something that they really like, they'll go, oh, you know what? I'm interested in this. Just like when you go uh, to a a restaurant. I hate those tracks that look like $100 bills. The people leave them instead of a tip. If you're going to leave a track that looks like a $100 bill, there better be a $100 bill inside of it. Let me put it that way. Because people, if they get excited about it, then they look at it and say, oh, another cheap Christian, and throw it out. There are some really good tracks, by the way, if you're looking for them, for tips. There's a slot in there for you to put money. And don't jip the tip when you're trying to tell people about Jesus. Put it in abundantly. That's one of my pet peeves, okay? Because the reason I have, and and I had to laugh because actually first service, I just remembered while I was talking about it that somebody handed me a Bible tract a couple weeks ago. And I was at a restaurant and they came up and said, can I give you a tract? And I'm thinking, well, you're standing right here. Why don't you just tell me about Jesus? Why would you come up and say, here, can I hand you this? Instead of saying, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Why not be more personal? Why not actually tell me? If it made that big of a difference in your life, shouldn't you want to tell me about it instead of just letting somebody else tell me about it on a piece of paper that they wrote who knows where? One of my other pet peeves, I had a lady in my church in Fort Dodge. She came up to me on a Sunday after I talked about talking to people about Jesus, and she said, I witness to my neighbors every Sunday morning. I said, great. She goes, yeah. I said, how you doing? Well, my neighbors drink a lot on Saturday night, and they're hungover on Sunday morning. So when I go to church, I get all dressed up, nice pretty dress, and I sit in the car, and I lay on the horn (laughs) until I see their eyes peek out the window, and I think, yep, now they know. And then they see that I look nice, and I'm going to church, and they'll want to be like me. And I looked at her, I said, let me tell you something. Your neighbors hate your guts. <laughs> when you pull away, the name of Jesus is being proclaimed in that house, but it's not in a good way. They hate you. I said, those people wish you would move. You can't witness to somebody by doing that. That's not helpful. People don't see, oh, she's dressed up and she gets up early in the morning on Sunday. I guess I want to be like that. That's not how it works. They need to see the fruit. They need to see what's on the inside. If anything, you know your neighbor's all hung over on Sunday morning, go get them a Gatorade and drop it off. Be helpful. Don't be harmful. Telling somebody about Jesus is as simple as telling your story. Telling stories is easy. I love telling stories. If you can't tell, I like to tell stories. 
We've been talking about it in OSL a lot. If you've taken OSL, if you're currently in OSL, you'll notice this. I'm going to lay it out just the same way that they did because they've put it so simply and plainly that I can't make it any easier. We talked about how to tell your story in OSL. The first thing that they tell you is keep it to one to two minutes long. Don't go on and on forever. Don't try to tell everything that's ever happened in your entire life because you might interact with somebody at a restaurant, in an elevator, wherever, standing in line at Walmart. You got to be able to get it out there. Don't go on and on and on and on. There's three things that your story should include. Number one, what your life was like before you met Jesus. Number two, how you met Jesus. And number three, what your life was like after you met Jesus. It's as simple as that. That's as plain as I can put it. What you're trying to tell somebody is, hey, a major change happened in my life and I'm all the better for it and you can have the same thing. That's essentially what you're telling them. You don't have to sell it. You don't have to to have all the answers or sit there and go through 15 scriptures and say, this is why you need Jesus. If they're not a Christian, they probably don't care what the scripture says anyway. But if they can see the difference in your life, they can say, now that, that I want to get a hold of. I don't care if you dress nice, you get up early. That doesn't, I don't care. What I want to see is how is your life different. You don't have to preach the entire Bible. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to be willing to step out and share. Simply share your story. Use things from your everyday life. Don't overdo it and scare people off. Try not to use Christianese. Okay? There is this language that we as Christians use in church. And if you don't go to church, you don't understand it. There are things that we say that people will look at you like, I have no idea what you're talking about. If you go up to somebody and say, hey, can I tell you about Jesus? They're going to know what you're talking about. If you go up to somebody and say, excuse me, have you been washed in the blood? <laughs> They're going to say, what are you talking about? No, 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 the blood of the lamb. And they're going to go, so you guys kill sheep up there top of the hill? Is that what you do? Those are words they're not going to understand. For some reason, we tend to go into this Christian mode where we can no longer be uh, ourselves and just be free-flowing, and, and we go into this like, oh, got to be serious now. Got to be serious and tell somebody this is how it's got to go. <clears throat> there was a guy that went to my church, and he was a uh, normal guy, everyday guy, worked a normal job, talked just like I'm talking to you, except when you asked him to pray. He would go King James. And he would be talking, and his voice would always go deeper in prayer. And you'd say, hey, can you pray for us? Oh, yeah, I'll pray for it. Dearest Heavenly Father, we cometh before thou this day and asketh for thy... I'm like, what happened? It was like he was possessed or something. I'm like, what the heck happened? It only happened when he prayed. And I'm going, why do you think that that's what you have to do? Talk to God like you talk to anybody else. Like I said, I, I, God, make it obvious. I'll be the first to tell you, I'm kind of stupid sometimes. Make it obvious. I need to know what's going on there. Jesus was a storyteller. Jesus had a sense of humor. He had a personality. He wasn't a stuffed shirt. Don't be so uptight all the time. You have the Spirit of God living in you that will help you with what to say when you need it. Remember, we, talk, we looked at that last week. Luke 12, 11 and 12. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. In that very hour. Yeah, I wish I had a script. I wish God would tell me a day ahead of time, hey, tomorrow you're going to meet a person, and this is what I want you to say to him. It doesn't always work like that. You rely on the Holy Spirit in that very hour. Don't worry about saying something wrong. Don't worry about saying something stupid. Just get out there and say something. We all say stupid things. But the Holy Spirit can take what you say and He can get it through to somebody on their level. I've said stupid things. I've said stupid things from right here. Anybody else ever say something stupid? I was, uh, I went to visit a friend of mine at a church, a four-square church in Waverly, Iowa, a few years back. He was up there. 
and uh, he was new to Foursquare. I'd only met him two, three times maybe. And I said, okay, uh, I just want to go and encourage them on a Sunday. I said, I, I called him up. I said, I want to come and encourage you. I want to come to your service. I want you to know that, you know, we are the four square. We are, you know, brothers, and I want to support you. I want to encourage you. He said, great. I said, are you going to be there Sunday? He goes, I'm going to be there, but I've got a, a young man who's going in, off to the mission field. He's going to be speaking. I'm not going to speak. I said, that's fine. I just want to come and be a part of your service and just support you. He said, great. And he told me, well, there's going to be uh, services at 8 o'clock. And I said, what time is second service? And he said, there is no second service. Now, he was an hour and a half away. So I'm like, I got to drive an hour and a half and be there at 8 o'clock. And he goes, but there's a potluck afterwards. And I'm thinking, what are you going to eat at like 10 o'clock in the morning for the potluck? But I said, okay. So I said, I'm coming. So I came. And I got to my turn off, and the road was closed. So there was uh, road construction there, and I had to figure out how to get around it. In the meantime, his wife called me and said, hey, there's road construction. Uh, let me tell you how to get there. I said, yeah, I noticed. I, I figured it out. I'm, I'm on my way. I'm almost there. And she goes, okay, well, you're probably going to beat me there because I had to go home to get your number. So uh, the pastor will be back with the worship team, so just go in and I'll find you when you get there. I said, great. Um, you know, like I said, I've only met these people a couple times, but I, I just, you know, I like them. I wanted to encourage them. So I get there, and, and I was there early, so there was hardly anybody there, and and I walked in, and I talked to the guy at the door, and I went and sat down. A few minutes later, uh, I feel a tap on my shoulder, and I look, and it's the pastor's wife. She's there, and she gave me a hug. She's like, oh, yeah, it's great to have you here. It's great to see you. And uh, she goes, can you give me a hand with something? I said, sure, what do you need? She goes, I got something in the car, but it's too heavy. Can you come and carry it? I'm like, okay, great. It's a potluck. It's probably a casserole or a crock pot, something, you know, whatever. So I go out to the car, and she opens the door, and there's a baby there, a newborn baby in the car seat. And I kind of looked at her because I'm thinking, there is no way you people have a newborn baby. <laughs> Sorry, but you're a little old to have a newborn baby. And she goes, this is my grandson. He's a week old. And I asked my daughter if I could bring him to church and show him off. And I said, great. Now, I'll remind you again, I don't know these people very well. I don't know their family. I don't know their grandkids. I don't know anything about them. So I grabbed the baby in the car seat, and I walk inside. And I walked in the foyer of the church. And she disappeared. So now I'm standing in a church that I've never been to, holding a baby. And every woman in the place gathered around me. And they're all coochie-cooing the baby and talking to the baby and whatnot. And then one older lady looks at me and she goes, what's the baby's name? And I looked at her and I said, I don't know. I don't even know who his mother is. which was a true statement. <laughs> and she got upset. And I couldn't figure out why. I thought, what's this lady's problem? And she looked at me, she goes, well, I never. And she marched off. <laughs> and it didn't dawn on me for about 10 minutes, and I realized, this woman thinks I have an illegitimate child with a woman I don't know. I should have said, it's not my baby. But I didn't. Somebody first service said, how much of that did you exaggerate? I said, that's word for word. That's exactly how stupid I can be sometimes. So I said something very stupid. Now the pastor's wife came back and she said, come sit up in the front row with me. I said, great. We went up in the front row uh, and she disappeared again. And then the usher comes up and said, sir, you left your diaper bag out there. And I'm thinking, this is not my baby. This is not. And the other weird stuff happened there. It was, it, it was weird. The worship team came off the platform and went past me. I was Somehow I was behind the worship lead. It was really weird. But the young man got up there and he spoke, and he only spoke for about 20 minutes. So there was time left over. And so I'm sitting there, and I, you know, I'm just enjoying whatever. The pastor got back up, and he was kind of talking and kind of figuring out what to do for the next few minutes. And, and he looks down, and I'm in the front row, and he goes, oh, I'm so glad you're here. He said, will you stand up? And he told everybody, hey, this is Pastor Tim. He's here from Fort Dodge. And I immediately looked for that woman that <laughs> told me off. Because I thought, wait till she hears I'm a pastor. <laughs> but he says, oh, I'm so glad to have you here. And, and then I, I sat back down, and his wife goes, we should have Tim speak. And I thought, yeah, I'll come back sometime and speak. You know, not a problem. That'd be great. And he goes, that's a great idea. I don't know what he's going to say, but I'm sure it'll be good. And he dropped the microphone in my lap, and he sat down. And I'm going, 
ha, funny, you know, whatever. And he's like, no, 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 go ahead. I'm like, go ahead and what? Go ahead, just say what's on your mind. And I thought, So I stood up. And in that very moment, every scripture I've ever learned in my entire life left my brain. I could not remember John 3.16. I had nothing. One thing popped into my head. Judges chapter 3. The book of Judges, this is where King Eglon is. The story about King Eglon was he was so fat that when he was stabbed with a sword, the handle and everything went into his stomach. That's the only scripture I could come up with. And I could quote it word for word. I can't do it now, but I did then. And I stood up there and I quoted the scripture. And then I started talking. And to this, I talked for about 15 minutes. I have no idea what I talked about. I cannot tell you to this day what I said. The whole time I'm just thinking, I'm never going to be able to come back to this church ever again. I am so done. There is no way. I got done. We went and had our potluck of bratwurst and sweet corn at 10 in the morning. It was odd. And I had about a half a dozen people come up to me and say, hey, that was, that was great, that word that you gave. That was right what I needed to hear. And I'm thinking, you must be crazy. That was horrible. Like, that was terrible. But then I had a guy come up, and he grabbed a hold of me, and he said, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. He said, I'm a pastor, and, and, and I've been pastoring for a number of years, and I got burned by the church. And he said, I was ready to give up, and I'm done. And after hearing what you said there, it encouraged me that I'm going to keep going. And I'm not going to quit. And I'm going to see what God's got for me to do. I'm not done with this. And I sat there and I went, that had nothing to do with me. Because what I said was stupid. But it had everything to do with the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit actually did speak to him. He showed him things through what I was saying. As weird as what I was saying was, see, I can speak to your ears, but the Holy Spirit can speak to your heart. He took those words and used them to implant something inside of him. I had the Holy Spirit inside of me. I wasn't alone. Remember, you're not alone either. Matthew 28, 20, that last verse, the Great Commission. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the same context, the same breath, right after he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples. It's the same breath. So he's saying, when you're doing that, I'm with you. It's not two totally separate things. He's saying, you go, and I'll be there. You're swinging with a net. The Holy Spirit is there to catch you when you say something stupid. He can take those words, and he can use them. I want to take a quick look here. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15 through 17. The Holy Spirit, though you can't see Him, is there working with you. We have to be able to see through our spiritual eyes instead of just our physical eyes. In 2 Kings, I'm just talking about Elisha here and his servant, and his servant got excited. It says in verse 15, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? And he said, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is what was going on in the spiritual. Elisha knew that. He said, you can't can't be fooled by what you see with your physical eyes. There's more going on here. The Spirit of God is here. He is, he is with you. The Spirit lives inside of you. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. If that Spirit can raise Jesus Christ from the dead, He can give you the words to say to your neighbor. That's nothing. He can give you the words 
when you're telling someone about Jesus, but you have to make every effort to do that. He's not going to grab you, pull you over to somebody and start making your mouth go. You have to be willing to take that step. Jesus' instructions are for all of us. The reason I titled this, You Got This, because I want you to know you got this. I want to encourage you to tell you, you can do this. You can do it today. You can tell people about Jesus. Tell them what happened in your life. You don't have to know all the answers. All you have to do is be willing to share what you know and what God has done in your life. You can do it. You got it. You pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you. God, I thank you that you use us in this way. God, that you give us the opportunity to tell people about you, that you didn't say, okay, you got it, now go over there and I'll take care of these other people. You said, no, I want to use you. I want you to be my witness. I want you to be the one to give the testimony that says, I know this guy. Lord Jesus, I pray that you will make it obvious to us when those opportunities come. Make it obvious to know who to talk to. Make it obvious to know what to say. God, I pray that you'll also hold us accountable. I pray that you'll make it obvious when we're not doing it. I pray, God, that when we know we should tell someone and we don't, that you bring that back to our mind. God, that you remind us, not to, to tell us how lousy we are, but to remind us that, yeah, next time, you'll get them. Lord Jesus, I pray for a boldness for those here. God, I pray for courage. Lord Jesus, I, I, I pray that, they, that the people here will realize that they have what it takes to do this. They're not inferior. That we all get rejected from time to time, and it's going to happen. But that's no reason to give up. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you give a passion to all of us to tell people who you are. Give us a passion and a fire that as your word says that we have to tell someone so our joy may be complete. Lord Jesus, stir our hearts, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.